Heavenly Father, we thank you for our workers' meeting. Thank you for the training you are giving us. I will thank you for the word you are revealing to us every time. We are asking, Lord, that the grace to be obedient to the word you will grant to everyone in Jesus' name. As we are helping others and pointing the way to heaven for other people, we pray that we ourselves will not miss the way in Jesus' name. We pray that you help us to be sincere, faithful, transparent, living the life we ought to live as representatives of Christ everywhere in Jesus' name. Once again, reveal your mind. Show the way. And show us, Lord, how to be what we ought to be. Make us faithful every moment of the way. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7. And we're reading from verses 13 and 14. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in their heart, because straight, narrow, is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. It strikes you seriously that these are the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. As you listen to John, and as you listen to other writers inspired by the Spirit in the Word of God, you remember what John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away, tell me, the sin of the world. Making it very clear. The sacrifice is for everyone in the world. Jesus Christ came to pay the penalty for sin for all sinners were told that he came to taste death for every man we're looking at hebrews chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 9 hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 but we see jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He died for everyone. As for the desire of God to grant us salvation, he wants everyone saved. In Second Peter chapter 3, reading here from verse 9, the Lord is not slack, Concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that how many people? All should come to repentance. If you left it in the hand of God alone, and if he would have his way, have his will, everyone would have been saved. First Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. What's good in his sight? What's his desire? What does he want? What does he want to see accomplished? Verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 
Look at verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom, tell me, for all to be testified in due time. So as we look at the plan of salvation, the plan of God, and we listen to the heart of Christ, he wants everyone saved. He gave the sacrifice for everyone. He wants you saved. He wants your relatives saved, all without exception. He wants all our neighbors saved without exception. And he has paid the price. And what he did on the cross of Calvary is enough to get everyone into the kingdom. And that same Jesus, that same Savior, that same Redeemer, that same Lamb of God that shed his blood for all to be saved tells us, enter ye in. He says, I counsel you. He says, I command you. He says, I exhort you. He says, I'm pleading with you. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Don't just think because the sacrifice is made. His blood is shed. Everything is there to get everyone saved. Therefore, we'll be saved automatically. He says, you have something to do. You see, there are people. They think everything is in the hand of God. God's sovereignty. He wants you saved. You're saved. He wants you sanctified. You're sanctified. He wants you feel with the Holy Ghost. You're feel with the Holy Ghost. He wants you strong. You're strong. He wants everybody saved. Everyone sanctified, everyone holy, everyone pure, everyone on the way to heaven. But there is human responsibility where they choice. That's why it says, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And do you know that in spite of the sacrifice, in spite of the provision for salvation, there will still be people that will be lost. In fact, Jesus said, Many there be which go in there at. And he gives us the receipt. That's why he says in verse 14, Because. He says, Because people want the easy life, the broad way, the way of sinning, the way of the society. And the way that accommodates everything, accepts everything, it says, because straight, narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Tell me what follows there. And few there be that find it. I want to remind you, there is no prophet like Jesus, no preacher like Jesus, no theologian like Jesus, no scholar like Jesus, no man, no teacher like Jesus, no prince, no priest like Jesus, no philosopher like Jesus, no author, no writer like Jesus who knows the way into heaven. He came from heaven and he came to show the way. And there is nobody, no man on earth that knows the way to heaven like the only begotten Son of God. Not only that. As you look at the audience of Jesus, the people Jesus spoke to, he was speaking to adults. He wasn't speaking to little, little children, infants, speaking to adults, religious adults, who would have thought, would have done everything. He was speaking to Jewish adults. He was speaking to young, upcoming adults. And he preached to them and he revealed the way, the gate and the way to heaven. And he says, there is a gate and everyone that wants to get to that eternal destination must enter in. And you in particular, you want to get to heaven, you must enter in. And it's not just to enter in at the gate and stay there. You must walk and walk and walk in the way. The gate 
is supposed to give us entry into the road, into the way. And the way is supposed to lead us in the place or to the place that we call heaven. I'm sure you understand it's not enough to see the gate. I see the gate there. I have to go through. I must enter. It's not enough to know the gate. Oh, I know that if you want to get to such and such a place, the gate is at such and such a place. It's not enough to know. You must enter. It's not enough to admire the gate. There are people, they admire the Bible. They admire the Word of God. And they admire the gate. And as to describe the gate, they say, you know, I just love it. It's not enough. And it's not enough to write or talk about the gate. There are many talkers, there are many people that can stay there talking and talking and they never enter in. And it's not enough to watch over the gate. There are some religious people and there are some people in church, they think that their responsibility is to watch over everything that is done in the church. They are not watching over their soul and they are not watching to make sure that they have entered the gate. They just want to watch the gate. It's not enough. You must enter. And this is the active word, and these are the powerful sentence and verb that Jesus shares. He said, enter ye in at the gate. Look at chapter 7 of Matthew, verse 21. Verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter, that's the word, that's the word, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but she that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, enter. And it's not enough to just shout, Lord, Lord, we must enter. I'm looking at Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, I'm reading verse 17, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeling to him and said, Good master, what shall I do that I may enter eternal life, inherit eternal life? And then the Lord began to tell him, what should you do? Verse 22, and he was sad at that same, and he went away grieved, for he had great possession. The Savior was there. He could have been saved. The Master was there. He could have entered in. And he showed him the way to enter. But you know, he couldn't pay the price. He couldn't do what was necessary. And he went back. That's why we're reminding ourselves. It's not enough to say, I know the way. The man knew the way. The Master just told him now. And it's not enough to say, I desire to get to heaven. Everybody desires to get to heaven. He came running asking, what shall I do so I can inherit eternal life? But you need to make it. I pray you'll make it. But you know, you have to take the step. And you have to abandon everything that will hinder you from entering. Look at verse 23. And Jesus looked around around about him and says unto his disciples, how hardly shall they they that have riches, tell me the word, enter into the kingdom of God. See, there are people that think that Christ will lower the standard for them. The church will lower the standard for them. The preacher will lower the standard for them. The evangelist will lower the, 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 uh, the standard for them. That's so and so. That's such and such. But the gauge is the same. That gauge you enter in by repentance and by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people who confuse others. We're looking at Luke chapter 11 verse 52. Luke chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 52. It tells us, Won't you lawyers, I tell you this were preachers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. The people, uh, they say the, the standard is too high for them. They cannot enter. That gate is too narrow for them. It's too straight for them. They don't want to enter. They don't want to pay the price. And then they discourage other people. They say, you can't do that. Do you think you can? I'm sure you don't want to enter that kind of gate. Do you think you can? Something that will not take you and your sin. 
will not take you on your pride, will not take you on your habit, will not take you on your evil, will not take you on your hypocrisy, will not take you on all defilement in your life. They want to do that. They do not enter and they hinder other people from entering in. I pray you will not be like that. I said I pray you will not be like that. You know, that's what Satan does. He says, I'm not going to heaven, so why should I allow other people to go? And they'll take people, try people, put pressure on people, divide people, distract people, and they do everything to make it difficult for others to get to heaven. And other people, there are people that are doing Satan's job for him, that they are not entering and they are not helping other people to enter in. We're looking at John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5. John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You know what it takes now? We must be born again. We must be born again. And it is that new birth that makes us to enter. That's the gateway, the gateway into the kingdom. We're looking at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. I read from verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter. That's the word again, enter. There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So you understand? Adultery, fornication, defilement, lying, fraudulence, stealing, cheating, hypocrisy, pride, works of the flesh will hinder people. And we have to drop all that at the gate before we can enter in. Come back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, reading here from verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way, which leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. It's not enough to say, I found the way. Are you walking in it? I know the way. Are you walking in the way? I prefer the way. That's why I come to deeper life. I've looked at this, I've looked at that, and I see that the way as described, as preached, as proclaimed by deeper life, I prefer that. Are you walking there? It's not enough to point the way. Other people, that person is missing the way. That person is missing the way. My friend, come. Look at the way. It's not enough to point the way. You yourself must walk in that way. And you ask yourself, as a Christian, as a worker, ask yourself, as a minister, are you really walking in the narrow way? Are you really walking in the broad way? Any self-denial? Any personal self-discipline? Any control? Any check over your life? Or do you just do whatever? Say whatever. Act however. And it's not that self-denial, self-discipline in your life. Preacher, walker. And Jesus said, you must walk in the narrow way. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 3, they also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. That's what it takes, Jeremiah chapter 6. 
I'm reading from verse 16, Jeremiah chapter 6, reading from verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways. Don't be too much in a hurry. Stand. Be patient. Look at everything around. And look at the various ways people are taking stand in the ways. And see and ask for the old paths. What is the good way? The old one is a good way. The ancient one is a good way. The one declared by Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, that's the good way. The one that the disciples, apostles, continue to proclaim in their epistles after he's gone to heaven, that's the good way. And he says, what is the good way? And walk therein. Don't just talk about it. And walk therein. I pray the Lord will help us. Well, walk in that way in Jesus' name. John chapter 8. We're reading from verse 11. John chapter 8, verse 11. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus says unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's a narrow way. Shed that extra weight, the load of sin, and all the bad habits of your past life. Drop everything at the gate, and now go and sin no more. Verse 12, then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. How will he walk? But shall, shall have the light of life. As we look at this word today, I'm talking to you on the, our happiness and hope in the heavenly way. Our happiness and hope in the heavenly way. Three things. Number one, the decision to enter the narrow way. You have to make up your mind. The decision. A sinner must take that decision. A backslider must take that decision. A compromiser must take that decision. A person that is not neither here nor there must take that decision. The decision to enter into the narrow way. Number two, the dedication to establish many in the narrow way. We mustn't forget our calling. We mustn't forget that we're not just religious workers. We're workers leading people in the narrow way. And we want to establish as many converts as possible, as many disciples as possible, as many members of the kingdom in the kingdom as possible. Establish them in the narrow way because that's what will give you reward on the final day. It's not just that, you know, we're going out, we're reaching them, we're calling them, we're touching their lives, and we're evangelizing. A day in the narrow way. Or did they just come in and they do as they like? They see in the broad way, and you're counting one, two, three, four, five. You're counting numbers of the people that are not in the narrow way. You want to help people, encourage people, establish people. And you want to uh, enlighten people. Here is the way, walk ye in it. And you must be dedicated to that. Making people, helping people, assisting people to understand the narrow way and be established in the narrow way. The dedication to establish many in the narrow way. Number three, the demonstration of engaging more in the narrow way. The demonstration of engaging more in the narrow way. We need more hands. And we need more hands that, because while we're taking care of this, that one is slipping away from us. While we're helping this one, get up. Walk in the narrow way. Get rid of all these things away from your life. And move in the narrow way. While we're doing that with one, other people are becoming careless. We need more people, more people that will do what we're doing. And they will be engaged in establishing more people in the narrow way. The demonstration of engaging more in the narrow way. God will help us. I said God will help us. 
will do it in Jesus' name. Number one, tell me number one. The decision to enter the narrow way. We're coming back to this, Matthew, the words of Jesus. We can never be tired. We cannot be tired or fed up reading the words of Jesus. Eternal Christ, eternal word. It says in Matthew chapter 7 verse, uh, verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in their heart. The way of the majority is a way of destruction. The way of the multitude is the way of destruction. The way of self-indulgence is the way of destruction. The way of do whatever you like, there's no evidence of conversion. There's no allowance for correction. And there's no allowance for consecration. And all that people do, they're religious, they profess, they're born again, but the Bible does not support their testimony. And the way they want is for the flesh to do whatever it wants. For the mind to think whatever it wants. And for the behavior, the character, to be as loose, as careless, as indulgent as it's going to be. And such people are part of the many on the way to their destruction. Examine your life. Examine your own character. Examine your own Christian profession. How do you live? Any self-denial there? Any control there? Any obedience to the word of God there? Any check in your conscience? Is your conscience still alive? Or it is dead that now you can be self-indulgent and think that you're a Christian? Look at verse 14. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 23. In Luke chapter 13, verse 23, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Are there few that be saved? You see, we have to repent. Our righteousness has to go beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisees. Hypocrisy has to be cancelled. Our lives have to be transparent. We have to follow the pattern and the pattern of life of Christ. I can't see many people doing that. Lord, are there few that be saved? Look at his answer. Verse 24. Strive to enter in. Strive to enter in. The kingdom of God sovereign violence and the violent take it by force. You'll fight against the indulgence of your life. You'll fight against the carelessness of your life. And you'll fight against the worldliness of your life. Strive. Not you, that you're striving with anybody. You're striving with yourself. You're endeavoring, striving to enter at the, at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. I pray you'll be able. I pray you will enter. How do we enter? Proverbs chapter 28, reading from verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. That's the way of those on the broad road, uh, the wide gate. They pretend as if they don't know what is right. They cover up. They are not sincere with themselves. They are not faithful to their own souls. They know that all those things are there and it will hinder them from getting to heaven. They cover it up. And the word of God says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. What are you covering up? Have you done your restitution? Have you made your way right? Are you living the life of holiness? 
Are you pure in heart? Are you copying a lot of impurities in your life, defilement in your life, insincerity in your life? Are you covering defilement? Are you covering a kind of careless, loose life? And then you say, Lord, Lord, he that covereth the sea shall not prosper. Are you into fraud? Are you stealing? Are you cheating? And you're covering that up. You cover it up with prayer. You cover it up with name. You cover it up with title. He that covereth a sinner shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them. That's what you do at the gate. It's at the gate that leads to the way of righteousness. That leads to the way that gets to heaven. We get all those things confessed. And we get rid of them. Forsaketh them shall have mercy. Happy is the man that feareth always. But he that hardeneth his heart, what will happen? Tell me out aloud there. Shall fall into mischief in time. Thank God the gate is still open. And everyone can enter in. Look at Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, reading from verse 5. Luke 19, verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today, I must abide at thy house. And he made haste. He made haste. He had to do something. You cannot say, well, the Lord will save me. I don't have to do anything. Mom, dad, the Lord will save them. They don't have to do anything. They have to do something. They must repent. They must take Jesus to their heart. They must believe. And they must turn away from evil and go the way of righteousness. My boy, my daughter, you will get in eventually. They must do it now. The Lord can come at any time. Young people die. Old people die. And if you're going to be saved today, it's the day of salvation. You cannot toy. You cannot gamble with the way of salvation and think everything will be all right later. It will not be all right without you coming down and without you making his and without you making this day the day of salvation. He made haste and he came down and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, when they saw it, they all murmured saying, that he was gone to the guest with a man that is a sinner. But Zacchaeus did not listen to all those people. You know, if you're looking at the winds that blow and the storm that rages, you never do what you really need to do. If you think of what they say about me, what they think about me, what they gossip about me, and what, uh, you know, they are commenting about my decision, my decision to follow the Lord, my decision to repent, and my decision to enter at the straight gate. If you are listening to all that gossip, you will not take your stand. You know, sometimes you are a preacher, sometimes you are a worker, and you, are, you say, if I make right my way, I've not been living right. I know that I'm not in the narrow way. I mean, I'm indulging myself. I'm into the sin of the flesh. I mean, into all these evil things. I know I'm afraid. If Christ comes now, I know I will not make it. I want to repent, but what will they say? They'll say, so, so, and so, 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 and so. It's not in yet. Zacchaeus did not think about what they were saying or what they could say or what they could do. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. Zacchaeus, that's not enough. That's not enough. We cannot use generosity to cover up our stealing. We cannot use being, uh, you know, 
open handed and helping people generous. We cannot use that to cover up all the things we have stolen. And for my good, I give to the poor. Zacchaeus passing off. Zacchaeus said, Yes, I know. Yes, I know. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, tell me what will happen. I restore him fourfold. Have you done that? Have you made restitution? Have you corrected your life? Have you cleaned up your life? Or are you just saying, I give money to this, I give this, I give this, I give that. That one will not cover up the need, the necessity of making right what is wrong in your life. And Zacchaeus knew, I must enter in at the straight gate. This is what he takes. There must be repentance. There must be restitution. And then you enter in at the gate. And you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for you to take all your sins away. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house for as much, for so much, as he is the son of Abraham. I pray it will happen. I said it will happen. See, we have to do that. Except we do that, except we repent and make right our ways, we cannot enter at that gate. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. Acts, chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 18. In Acts chapter 19, verse 18, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. They came, they said, yes, we believe, but there must be an evidence of that faith in Christ. If we have faith in Christ, we'll abandon occultism, we'll abandon witchcraft will abandon the works and the powers of darkness. We'll take all that regalia of occultism, burn it up. We'll take all those books of occultism, burn them up. And all the things that are symbols of the white gauge and the broad road, we'll bring them together, we'll destroy them. That's why these people wanting to actually make sure they have entered into the straight gate and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. It's not enough to a young man to just say, I believe, I believe. All the covenant you made with all those uh, evil people, you destroy the covenant, you come out of them. And all the evidence and the symbol and the token and certificate they gave you that to belong to that, uh, you know, whatever group, whatever gang, you bring out everything, burn them, destroy them, come out clean. That's salvation. That you have repented, you made restitution, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and things are no longer the same. Look at verse 19. Many of them also, which use curious arts, brought their books together and they gave them as gifts to other people what did they do you know somebody says i can't choose this anymore because i don't want to perish i'm repenting i give it as a gift to my junior sister what a moment the thing will make you perish i'll say you don't want it anymore you are repenting and then you are giving it as a gift to somebody else. You want him to perish? You want her to perish? You don't love her? I can't uh, wear this again. I can't uh, take this again. I can't put on that again. Uh, because now I am born again. But you know, they are so costly. I cannot just give them up like that. And then I give them to people. You cannot use them. Because they will hinder you from getting to heaven. And then you pass it on to other people. That's wrong. They bunch them. Other people say, this is what I used to do. That's how I used to act. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm even fed up. What I'm going to do, I'll pass on that method. I'll pass on that idea. I'll pass on that technique. I'll pass on those evil things to other people. You want them to perish? You have conviction. You are convicted in your heart that doing this shows hypocrisy in your life. 
And doing this shows that you don't have the mark of a righteous person who is under self-control or the Spirit's control to go in the way of righteousness. And you are passing on the same bad habit, the same evil life. And the same badge, method, technique to all the people, that's not right. It says, look at that verse 19 again. Many of them also, which use curious as, brought their books together. Tell me what follows. And burnt them secretly. How? I said, how did they do it? You can tell if somebody has actually repented. You can tell if somebody does not care anymore about the opinions of men. You can tell if somebody is saying, all I want, I want to enter the straight gate. And I want to walk in the narrow way. I don't care what people say. They burnt them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God. God and tell me and prevail. We're coming to First Thessalonians chapter one. First Thessalonians chapter one. I'm reading from verse five. First Thessalonians chapter one. Reading from verse five. For gospel came not unto you in what only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. And in much assurance, as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us. It's okay about Paul the Apostle. You know Paul the Apostle. He walked in the narrow way. And these Thessalonian believers, they actually believed and they followed after his footsteps. And they walked in that same narrow way and you became followers of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. There was persecution, affliction, yet they had joy of the Holy Ghost. People misunderstood them, misrepresented them, misinterpreted them, yet they had joy in the Holy Ghost. People gossiped against them, yet they walked in the joy of the Holy Ghost. I pray that this same joy of salvation will be real in every life in Jesus' name. So that she were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad. So that we need not speak anything. For they themselves, look at this, show of us. What manner of entering in we urge unto you. How, tell me, how, tell me out aloud, ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Many people who are telling us today, I'm saved, I'm saved, we cannot tell what they have turned away from. They have not turned away from anything, from their past life, from their sinful life. From their idolatry. Because many of them still have money as an idol. And they still take position in the world as an idol. And they still take whatever they want their flesh as an idol. But it says that these people, they turned away from idols. And they turned away from everything the world holds dear. And they turned unto God in verse 10 and to wait. For his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I pray that this will be real in every life in Jesus' name. Entering the gate is an instantaneous experience, not a gradual experience. Have you heard some people? I am trying to get born again you are born at an instant of time salvation is not something that i'm getting saved i'm getting saved i'm getting saved three weeks they're getting saved three months they're getting saved two years they're getting saved you enter the gate 
at a moment of time. It's an instantaneous experience. There's a definite repentance with a decisive act of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what takes the sinner from sin to salvation. That's what takes the sinner from darkness unto light. That's what is called conversion. That's what is called salvation. That's what is called transformation. Entering the gate takes place in a moment of time. But walking in the way continues throughout life. You're walking and you keep walking until you get to heaven. And while you're walking the narrow gate and people comment and people condemn and people criticize and people persecute, you don't stop that. You keep on in the narrow way. If your goal, if your aim is to get to heaven, you don't shift and cross over to the broad way. That's what everybody is doing now. I'll do it with them. Have you lost your focus? Have you lost your perseverance? To get to heaven, we keep on walking in the narrow way. That demands, number one, faith. You say, have faith in the Lord. Say, have trust in the Lord. I will still know this is the only way, the only way that will take me to heaven. Number two, it will take grace. You come to God every time asking for the grace of God so that by grace you live the life you ought to live. Number three, it will take prayer. You are praying so that you will not fall in temptation. Temptation may come, but by the grace of God, you will not fall. It will take obedience, obedience to the word of God. You cannot just say, I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God. I'm walking in the way and there's no obedience to the words of the Lord. The Spirit of God will speak to you, will correct you, will challenge you. And once the Spirit of God challenges you, you take it immediately. Those are the people that are walking in, in the narrow way. Isaiah chapter 30. In Isaiah chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 21. Isaiah chapter 30, we're looking at verse 21. And then ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. You want to get married? You'll hear, This is the way. You're walking your place of work, and you see the conflicting things that people are saying. The Spirit of God will say, This is the way. Walk ye in it. It may be a problem at home. The Spirit will say, this is the way, what you need. And it may be that you are challenged, why are you always like this, like this, like that? And then you go to the Word of God and say, this is what the Word of God says. And the Spirit of God will say, this is the way, what you need. When you turn to the right and when you turn to the left, there will be self-denial. You have to deny yourself. You cannot indulge yourself and say you are walking in, a, in the narrow way. Walking in the narrow way demands self-denial. It takes perseverance. Perseverance. Sometimes you are tired. You keep on walking. Sometimes they are pulling you to compromise. You keep on walking. And it's consecration. And it's consecration to the end. You lay everything on the altar. And say, Lord, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You make up your mind. You, make, you have a purpose of heart to cleave unto the Lord for the rest of your life. And you do it by the grace of God in Jesus' name. I can't hear the amen. amen. Come, we'll come to point number two now. And it's the dedication to establish many in the narrow way. The dedication, the discipline, the duty, the determination that I will not just walk in the narrow way myself. I'm going to help others to keep in the narrow way. We're coming to John chapter 17 verse 12. John chapter 17 and I'm reading from verse 12. In John chapter 17 verse 12, it says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. Here Jesus was talking about his own disciples. They repented. They were saved. 
They had their names written in the book of life in heaven. And Jesus constantly taught them. Constantly discipled them. Constantly matured them. And established them in the narrow way. He knew. He was the one that preached that. That you must enter at the straight gate. And you must walk in the narrow way. So that you'll get to that final destination. The kingdom of God. And so he kept his own disciples. How did he do that? How did he keep them in the kingdom? Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 36. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. And went. Where did he go? And went. I said where did he go? And went. I said where did he go? Into the house. And his disciples came Unto him, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. You know what happened here? He had spoken publicly. He had given the parable openly. Now in the house, the disciples wanted to understand more. And this is how he discipled his own followers. And in the house, as they asked him, he answered the question. In the house, chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 25. Chapter 17, verse 25. He said, yes, the Lord had asked Peter a question. And when, so the people collecting money asked Peter a question. Do, does your master pay tribute? And he said, yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own children or strangers? You know what? There was a point Peter did not take into consideration. And there are points Compass do not take into consideration. But when he came into the house, the Lord Jesus prevented him, said, don't talk about any other thing now. Let's settle this. Let me teach you this. Let me enlighten you on this. In the house. I'm looking at chapter 9 of Mark. Mark chapter 9. And I'm reading from verse 28. How he taught his own people. It wasn't limited to just the open general church meeting. In the house, he taught them. He trained them. He discipled them. He matured them. Chapter 9 of Mark. I'm reading from verse 28. In Mark chapter 9 verse 28. And when he was come. Where? Into the house. His disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? They wanted to know, Why are we so weak in faith? And why are we ineffective? This was in the house, and he taught them. Well, I need something here. If you take all the interactions of Christ the Master, Christ the Teacher, Christ the Savior. If you take his interactions with the disciples in the house, if you take that away, those disciples will not be well trained. What are we learning from that? He kept them in the narrow way. He established them in the narrow way. Through what they did in the house fellowship. And we must get involved. If we're going to follow Christ, that's where they can ask us questions. That's why we can ask them questions. That's why we can enlighten them. That's why we can educate them. That's why we can enlist them into the work of the Lord. That's where we can strengthen them. That's where we can show them how to overcome temptation. That's where we can get to their personal problems in details and see how to disciple them 
and establish them in the narrow way. I'm looking at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 17. And when he was entered into the house from the, pe uh, from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. They asked him, they couldn't ask in the open. There was no time. They could have asked if there was time. But they couldn't ask in the open, so they asked in the house. And he used that to teach them and to train them. Mark chapter 9, verse 33. Mark chapter 9, we're looking at verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, what was it? that she disputed among yourselves by the way. But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves which should be the greatest. And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. He taught them about humility. The way up is down. And the way to glory is the path of godliness. The way to heaven is the path of humility. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 5. Luke chapter 19 verse 5. Yeah, it tells us Jesus came to the place and he looked up and he saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must, tell me, tell me out aloud, I must abide at thy house. Couldn't he teach him openly there? Yes, he could. But he needed the convenience of the house setting. And then they got to the house and he taught him all things, many things. He ought to tell him so that he'll be grounded in the faith, matured in the faith, established in the narrow way. And he has commanded us and commanded all believers. And all true disciples to do the same. That is to follow his steps. And he has told us, go and do thou likewise. How did the disciples, in the Acts of the Apostles, how did they establish their converts, their followers of Christ, the disciples, in the narrow way? Let's see how they did it. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, I'm reading here from verse 41. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them, how many people? About 3,000 souls. And he continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers, look at verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from where to where, house to house, did, did, did each their meat or singleness, gladness, and singleness of heart. That's how they established their converse too. And that's what we're to do when people come to know the Lord. That's how we establish them. In their house, or in our house, or in the house fellowship. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple, and in every house. You see that? Daily in the temple, that's a multitude gathering together like we're here tonight. But then uh, the group pastor can get to the pastor in his house and help him more. Disciple him more. Establish him more. 
and the pastor can get to the house of any member, every house, disciple them, train them, establish them, ask them questions, know how their family set up is, and how their children are, and how to help them actually be firm in the decision to walk in the narrow way that leads to heaven. And the members can follow up their neighbors and their converts in their houses. It says, and daily in the temple, and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus. Oh, we'll do it. Chapter 9. I'm reading. I'm reading from verse 11. Chapter 9, verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays. You see, that's how Saul, Paul the apostle, was followed up to. And we read here in this chapter 9, verse 17. And Ananas went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight. And be filled with the Holy Ghost. It happened right there in the house. It will happen again. Amen. Acts chapter 20. Reading from verse 20 and verse 21. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. And now I kept nothing back, back nothing, that was profitable unto you. But I've showed you. And I've taught you publicly and from house to house. I taught you publicly in great gatherings. And then I taught you all those essential doctrines of repentance, of restitution, of righteousness, of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, of the danger of getting to hell, and of the glory of getting to heaven. And all the responsibilities of the Christian life. I taught you publicly. And I taught you from house to house testifying. Both to the Jews. And also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our calling. And this calling will demand consecration. Demand commitment. And it will be a daily occupation. That every day you are showing somebody the right way, the gospel way, the narrow way that leads to heaven. Acts chapter 28. Reading from Bastachi. Acts chapter 28. Bastachi. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. Paul the Apostle, when he couldn't have the chance of public ministry anymore, we're told here he dwelt in his own hired house, receiving all that came in unto him, preaching in the house, teaching in the house, Examining the word of God in the house. Establishing the people in the house. Making them strong, committed to walk in the narrow way in the house. Preaching the kingdom of God. And teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. With all confidence and no man forbidding him. I pray we'll do it like that in Jesus name. Point number three, the demonstration of engaging more in the narrow way. The demonstration of engaging more in the narrow way. 
for that me he says you're looking for believers who are real believers believers who are real children of god believers who have given their lives wholeheartedly complete, completely without any reservation they've given themselves unto the lord and then you want to see how to enlist them how to equip them how to engage them how to bring them in so that they'll take part in the work of helping people to come helping people to come out of the broad gate out of the broad road and to come to this narrow gate enter in as well as walk in the narrow way matthew chapter 9 verse 36 matthew chapter 9 Verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He was saying, We need more hands that will help people to recognize. The straight gate, help people to choose the narrow way, help people to counsel, to pray, and to teach, and to train, and to strengthen them in the narrow way. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We need more hands. Look at verse 38. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We're coming to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. In Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, then he called his 12 disciples. That's after he had told them, the harvest really is plenteous, the laborers are few, we need more hands, more workers, more laborers, more soul winners, more teachers, more people that are well taught who can teach other people. He said, he called the twelve disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Thank God they did. Thank God we are going to do it. I said, you are going to do it. But look at this. Some of these disciples forgot so soon. I pray you'll not be a forgetful hearer. If I'm talking to somebody there, I said, you'll not be a forgetful hearer. If you're not going to be a forgetful hearer, you'll do what is being said. Number one, you've entered at the gate. You're walking in the narrow way. And then you're establishing others to come through that same straight gate. And to walk through that narrow way. And you're helping other people also to help. But look at verse 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not us. Look at that. Jesus just told them, we need more hands. We need more workers. We need more soul winners. We need more laborers. And then there was somebody that was doing it, but not in their company. And instead of encouraging him, saying, that's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus just emphasized now. Just said, we saw one casting out devils. But it's not one of us. It's not a worker. Not a soul winner. Not one of the twelve. We're for body. We're stopping. Because he follows not us. And Jesus said unto him, tell me. And Jesus said unto him, tell me. Say it aloud. Say it like you'll never do that again. Forbid him not, for he that is not against us 
is for us. You see, there are people, they selfishly guard whatever work we're doing in so winning, in teaching other people, in exhorting other people, in establishing other people. And if anybody, any extra hand wants to come in, they look at him as, what are you doing? That's our work. That's our area. We are to establish the people. We are to disciple the people. We are to encourage the people. We are to train the people. Get up. Don't, don't do that. Don't touch that. But Jesus said, don't do that. Get him on board. And train him. And help him. That he will be able to do what you yourself, what you are doing. While the disciples were driving away new people, the Lord was looking for more people. Look at verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. Still looking for more people. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. We need more hands and engage more people. Enlist more people. Equip more people. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put a sand on the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Encourage everybody you know is born again. Everybody you know has entered through the narrow gate and is walking in the narrow way. And if they're not walking sufficiently in that narrow way, help them, teach them, pray with them, guide them, instruct them, strengthen them so that more grace will appear in their lives and they'll do it in Jesus' name. Don't let them go. As they are walking the narrow way, bring them in and train them so that you engage more people in the narrow way. Luke chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these six, the Lord appointed other 70 also. John saw one casting out devils, he forbade him. And Jesus said, I even need more than one. I need more than ten. And now you've got seventy others also. How many are you, leaders and workers in your district? Are you twelve? We need seventy others also. All those who are just in the church. All those people who are just there, warming the bench, and they're not doing the work. And you yourself, you're not doing enough. Let's do more and let's see how to encourage them. How to enlist them, empower them, so that you'll also be involved in the work, the will in Jesus' name. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two, before his face, into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest field. That's what he did. That's what he has commanded us to do. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 2. We're reading from verse 2. While you're opening to that, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, I want you to recollect the false prophets who deceived multitudes and had in them against the narrow way, the multiplying day after day. They are more in number than the faithful people, faithful teachers of the word of God. Those false prophets are more fervent now many of us, they're zealous, they're earnest, they're passionate, they're constant, they're relentless, they're deceptive, 
that dangerously affect you. And if those false prophets are so active, they're not lukewarm at all, and they're so fervent and fiery, those of us who have chosen the right way, the righteous way, the way of redemption, we need to be more fervent than they are. You must not be lazy. You will not be lazy. You will not be idle. You will be faithful in Jesus' name. Faithful in evangelizing the lost and bringing them into the kingdom. And encouraging and teaching and lightning and strengthening, establishing the people who have already come in. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. What you have heard, go and give it to other people. Raise other people. Train other people. Empower other people. Engage other people. More people. Let them be faithful to evangelize along with us. To disciple along with us. To teach along with us. And to equip others along with us. They don't uh, need position, title, whatever. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles Chapter 18, we're reading from verse 24. Acts, chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, a mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla heard, when they had heard, they took him. These were the people who were going to help this person to become more fervent, more knowledgeable, more instructed in the way of the Lord. They took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Look at verse 28. And he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. That's what the Lord is expecting that you and I will do. We'll be fervent. We'll be zealous. We'll be passionate. And we'll do this work the Lord has committed into our hands. Second Timothy chapter 4 reading from verse 1. Second Timothy chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. You'll do it. Preach the word every time you'll do it. Every day you'll do it. And you'll do it to bring people to that straight gate so that by the grace of God, they'll know what it means to repent what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and what it means to enter in by faith, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own law shall be heed to themselves, teachers having itching ears, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, 
do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. We'll do it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll do it like Christ has done it. Amen. First of all, you make sure you're examining yourself. Have you entered at the straight gate? You examine yourself. Have you, are you walking in the narrow way? Are you denying yourself? Are you abandoning everything that is evil? Everything that is wrong? Everything that indulges? And are you under the control of the scriptures? Under the control of the messages we're hearing? Are you under the control of the spirit of God? Are you walking in the narrow path that leads to heaven? Are you helping other people? Are you encouraging other people? Are you establishing other people? Are you helping them to make sure they have assurance they have entered through that gate and they are walking in that narrow way? And are you getting more hands? Are you educating more people, enlightening more people, enlisting more people? Are you engaging more people? Are you establishing more people to get the work done at long with us? Are you passionate? And then you're helping others to be passionate? Relentless, helping others to be relentless? Are you constantly effective? Are you helping others to be constantly effective? Are you showing the way of redemption, the way of salvation, and the way of transparent holiness? Are you showing it by your life? Are you showing it by the message that you preach? And are you constantly engaged every day without compromise, without looking back, saying and pointing the way to other people? This is the way. Walk ye in it. If we are being lax and lazy and idle and retarded today, we're going to rise up and take up this work again, and we're going to do it like no time ever before in Jesus' name. More zeal in the things of the Lord. More passion in the way of the Lord. More prayers and the more dedication that we're not going to compromise. We're going to continue until the final day. And when that final day will come and the Lord will look at you, he'll say, I see you. You entered through that gate and you walked in that way. And here now, enter into the joy of your Lord. I pray that none of us will miss the kingdom of God on that final day in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and pray. We're going to really pray. Nobody is going out now. Nobody is uh, being careless. And nobody is, uh, you know, waving hand and uh, signifying to us, stop, stop, stop. Nobody is disturbing anyone. You're telling the Lord, oh Lord, here am I. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to do your work the way you want me to do it. I want to make sure you examine yourself and you find out, have you entered through the gate? And have you, are you walking in the way, in the way of righteousness and the way of truth are you walking in the way that leads to heaven open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer and I'm going to walk in that way. I'm going to walk in that way. I'm going to walk in that way. It will help you. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. It will help you. It will help you. It will help you. Tell the Lord that this is what we are going to do. Tell the Lord this is what we are going to do. Tell the Lord this is what we are going to do. You enter yourself. You establish other people. And then you engage more people. To come and help and walk along with you in this narrow way that leads to heaven. 